Thanks for downloading Pave the Way Podcast. On this show, your host, Greg Helbeck, interviews the top minds in real estate, business, and personal development to help you crack the code so you can grow your business and, more importantly, grow your life. Get ready for another game-changing episode. If you want to learn how to master your day and become a productivity monster, download Greg's free guide on daily personal productivity for free at www.pavetheday.com. That's Pave the Day, spelled D-A-Y, dot com. Now it's time for today's episode. Enjoy. All right, everyone. Welcome back to the show. I'm here with a fellow New Yorker, Dan Bro, out of Rochester. And I'm looking forward to interviewing another guy who's uh, doing big things up in uh, the Northeast. So thanks so much for joining me today, Dan. Happy to be here. Awesome. I don't know too much about you. We don't really know each other too well. So I'm looking forward to kind of having this interview be, I guess, our introduction. Um, so I, let's just get right into it. So just tell the listeners a little bit about, you know, who you are and how you ended up getting into real estate. You seem like a pretty young guy. So it's always cool to interview uh, guys who are my age. Yeah. So uh, first and foremost, uh, father and husband uh, here in upstate New York. Uh, been in real estate for five years now, um, sales for almost 14 um, started, you know, started in real estate just cause I wasn't thrilled with, uh, my options for investing in the stock market and, and those retirement savings options and wanted more control and wanted something tangible that had more benefits, uh, in the short term. And so started learning as much as I could, you know, YouTube university, reading all the books, um, in uh interviewing every investor i could find and just picking their brain you know taking as many of them out to coffee as they would allow and uh then i actually ended up getting my real estate license not too long after that uh not because i had any intention of being a realtor um i've had my license for five years now i've never worked with one traditional buyer or seller um i did it for the education and so that i could buy and sell my own deals if they were ever on market or if I was flipping something and I was listing it. Yeah. Um, and MLS access, that was huge, um, for comping, you know, get the most accurate data. Um, and so started off with doing some flips and some rentals. And then, uh, after not too long, started to get into wholesaling because I had actually bought a few deals off wholesalers. Yeah. I had no idea you know, what wholesaling was, how they were getting these houses. Uh, but I saw the spreads that they were making. And I figured, man, if I can get these houses myself, I can basically double my profit on a flip. And I'll have more choices. And it seems just like, uh, why wouldn't I do it? Yeah. Um, and so then, you know, did a, a lot of different things, but uh, throughout my real estate journey, but that's where I started. That's awesome, man. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting how a lot of people almost fall ass backwards into wholesaling when they see some of these assignment fees, uh, especially down by me or even in California. I mean, you can make 50, 60 grand. That's not abnormal just due to the, the expensiveness of these properties. So uh, how did you then like go from obviously working in sales traditionally, like how long did it take for you to ramp up to where you were a full-time real estate entrepreneur and obviously making great money? So when I started in real estate, I was actually in medical device sales. Okay. Uh, so it, great gig. I mean, you can make six figures pretty easily and consistently. Yeah. Uh, and so I did that. I did real estate, you know, flipping on nights and weekends. I was doing all the work myself. Yeah. Uh, don't recommend it. <laughs> you were actually doing the construction yourself? Like you were I was, swinging hammers? I was. Um, I respect that. Yeah. I, uh, I learned a lot and uh, learned that I never wanted to do it again also. Yeah. Um, so I did that for a full year before, before I jumped ship and decided to just take that leap and, and go into real estate full time. That's awesome. And it's a good way that, you know, a lot of people think they have to just stop what they're doing and burn the boats, which works for some people. Um, but that's the benefit of this business is you can do a wholesale deal every few months and make some, some good ancillary income. And eventually, you know, once you figure out how the systems work, you can transition a lot easier versus like, I mean, when I got started, I was about five years ago now, almost six years ago and I was 20. So I was in college. So like I had no 
obligations or anything like that. So it was easier for me to kind of make those mistakes. I had no overhead and uh, eventually, you know, do it full time a couple of years later. So um, that's awesome, man. So let's, let's just deep dive now into your business, um, which is based obviously up in the Rochester area, because I've had a lot of New York investors on this show, or actually me and my good friend, Michael Pinter at a Long Island are starting a New York real estate podcast. And I think a lot of people watch YouTube videos on how to do this business and 90% of it is true, but the 10% that's different in New York is what really holds a lot of people up and they don't understand, at least down by me, I think it's similar in Rochester where, you know, you got attorneys involved and there's a lot of differences. So, you know, just, let's just talk a little bit about what makes New York a little bit different of a market, whether you're in Rochester or you're down in Long Island, because it's a definitely a different state to operate in. Yeah. So uh, first, it's a, an attorney state. So uh, states are either going to be a title state or an attorney state. So title state, um, the closings happen through a title company only. There typically aren't attorneys involved. Um, and that can make things go a little bit faster. Um, attorneys, uh, they're, they're pretty expensive. They like to slow things down. Um, sometimes they'll kill deals altogether. Um, yep. And New York in particular, um, and especially Rochester, I mean, it takes three, four, five weeks, sometimes just to get title work back. Yep, same uh, down here. Whereas same. in other states, they can turn it around in like a day, two days, three days. Um, yep. So getting deals done here can take a lot longer. And yeah. so I always advise, like, if you're going to be doing wholesaling in upstate New York, you need to have like three months of working capital just to be able to fund the business, fund your advertising spend until you can expect to get that money back. And that's why I see not very many big players in this market because you do need to have some funds. If you want to make this a real full-time business um, and you're, you're not doing it just on the side, like, yeah, you can do it on the side if you have other income. Yeah. But if this is all you're doing and you want to make this a real business, you need to have more working capital. You need to have great follow up systems because when these deals take longer, if you're not consistently keeping in touch with the homeowner that you're buying the house from, they're going to, they might get worried or concerned or confused. And that's the last thing you want on, on a real estate wholesale deal. Totally, man. Totally. I, I agree with you. And now in Rochester, so as a follow-up question, so like example down here, like sometimes I will lock a house up with a seller. My attorney doesn't like me doing that. And I, I get why it's not illegal. I'm not an attorney, but like you can technically do it in Rochester. Do you have the seller get their own attorney and then their attorney sends your attorney a contract and then you review it, you put a pretty big deposit down and send it back. Or do you guys do it differently in upstate? Cause I've heard people do it different in different because the state's obviously huge. So what do you guys do in terms of your process when you have a regular deal? So we use our own contract. Uh, okay. We, we fill cool. it out right when we are at the house. We do most of our appointments in person. Okay. Um, so the contract cool. gets filled out right then and there. Um, we need at least one attorney per transaction. Um, but sometimes there can be up to three attorneys. So, which yeah. makes it go so much slower. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's because then we'll have an attorney. Sometimes the seller has their own attorney and then our buyer will, ha will have their own attorney as well. Yeah. Um, I've been doing something recently to try to bring it down to just two attorneys so that our buyer doesn't use their own. Yeah. Um, cause I always, I always require a deposit. So uh, a small deposit goes to my attorney and then, uh, basically a down payment on the assignment fee goes to my company. And what I offered them is to pay a $500 smaller down payment to us if they use our attorney. Okay. So they, it's more expensive for them up front if they want to use their own attorney. Um, and that's been actually pretty effective in getting people to use our guy, which is better for everybody. It saves both parties money and it yeah. gets the deal done a whole lot faster. Dude, that's a lot more effect, efficient than what, what happens down here in the New York City area. I mean, down here, I, I've done that before and it's worked okay. But a lot, like I have a house in Westchester right now, which is like big money. 
And, you know, their attorney wanted this huge deposit. Like sometimes they'll want you to put 50 grand down. Like, and obviously oh, wow. I don't do that, but I mean, normally we're putting one, two, three, four, five, ten thousand dollars down, non-refundable, can't get out of the contract. And I've had deals literally where there's the seller's attorney, there's me and my attorney, there's the buyer and the buyer's attorney, and there's the lender and the lender's attorney all in the same office. I mean, I don't go to closings anymore, but it's like pandemonium. I did one a couple uh, months ago. It was me and my attorney. I happened to go to this closing, the seller's attorney, and then the lender, the lender's attorney, the buyer, the buyer's attorney. And the guy gives me the keys. And then I took the keys and passed them across the table to the buyer. And he goes, are you flipping it to that guy? I said, yeah. I said, what are you going to do now? Like we're at the closing table. So like it, it just gets <laughs> super weird. And I was laughing. Uh, it was a big deal too. So like, it's just a different area to operate in. So the, the, I guess the takeaway for people before we get into the mechanics of your business is like, if you're in New York, the biggest thing you can do is learn from people who are doing this in New York, specifically regionally. Like if you're in upstate, learn from Dan. If you're down in the Long Island, Hudson Valley area, learn from me or Michael. But don't take everything a guru says from Arizona or Texas and think it's going to work in New York because then you're going to get yourself confused. So make sure you're following people who are doing it in your state and region. And, uh, you know, I like this business in here because our spreads are bigger and there's less competition. So let's transition more on to like, you know, what does your business look like today? What are you doing from a, uh, an exit strategy standpoint? And then we'll cover some of your marketing. Yeah. So uh, we primarily focus on wholesaling. Okay. Uh, we'll do a small amount of it, sort of lipstick flips or wholetailing. Yeah, uh, it's closing on it and fixing it up real quick. Yeah, yeah maybe we're doing a clean out paint carpet, uh, nothing major. Uh, so we'll do a few of those every now and then. But um, I really prefer to do wholesaling. It is significantly less risk. Uh, yeah. You have less money into it. It's quicker. Um, it's just, it fits more of what I like to do. There's no managing contractors. There's no managing tenants. Uh, it's so that those things I like a lot more. Um, so we focus on wholesaling. Um, and right now we're, we average around 10 deals a month. That's awesome, dude. Yeah. Um, and our, our main, um, advertising sources, uh, TV is okay. one, uh, which has been awesome, hugely successful, uh, because there's not a lot of other people doing it. Um, mm. cause it is expensive to do, but the returns are there. Yeah. Uh, but it does scare away a lot of people because it is, oh, yeah. you know, a, a lot to commit to. Um, and then we have our, uh, handwritten letters, which are, have a, an awesome response rate. Um, and then, you know, we'll do, we, we've done a lot of different things, you know, we're, we're starting up cold calling again. Uh, we've done texting before, uh, Facebook ads, bandit signs, um, a lot of word of mouth stuff. So, you know, we always try to have at least three, uh, different lead generation sources going on at once so that we don't have too much concentration risk in any one area, because then we'd be susceptible to the ups and downs of that one source. That's great advice, man. I recommend that to a lot of people as well. Like the only real media that I've found that has been tried and true, I've not done TV yet is, I've found throughout the years with follow-up and consistency, direct mail will never fail you, assuming you're getting calls. If you're not getting calls, that's obviously a, a different problem. But I've found that channel has always produced a four to five to one return minimum for me. And it's just, I keep spending more money every month because I know it's there. But at the same time, I don't just depend on that. I have other channels, cold calling and referrals and JV deals and things like that. So, man, that's very impressive doing 10 deals a month in New York, man. That's got to be a logistical nightmare. <laughs> because I'm like doing four or five and I'm just like, oh my God, this is a lot. So uh, are you, do you have a, like, tell me about a little bit about your team. I mean, what does your team look like? That's yeah. A lot of volume. It certainly takes a team. Uh, yeah. So we have our, our COO um, who runs the day-to-day -day operations, leads oh, and wow. manages the team, um, holds them accountable um, as far as acquisitions, there are three of us who do actual appointments, the final closing appointments with sellers. Okay. Um, I am working to transition out of that. So I'm probably only doing maybe 20% of appointments anymore. Okay. Um, we have, uh, we actually just switched up our leads management department. So 
one of the big issues that that we've had, and, and this is so important, especially during a time like right now, when uh, a lot of homeowners still think the market is so hot, um, which it, in some parts of the country, it is still super hot. Up yeah. here, it's actually cooled down a lot over the past really? month. Um, but a lot of sellers don't know that yet because they're still seeing these closings occur now from deals that were signed like two months ago. Yeah. So they're seeing all these crazy numbers and the, they think that they can still get that, but it's just not the reality anymore. And because of that, they think they have more options. And so the time to the lead is even more important than ever. So shortening that cycle time from when that lead comes in to when we contact them, and then from when we contact them to when we get that appointment, that mm -hmm. those times have condensed because they think they have more options. So if we don't get to them soon enough, they just go on to the next company. Interesting. So, so we've uh, changed our leads management department. Um, we've gone back and forth on it. Uh, we've, we've played around with having uh, VAs in that department. We've, we've had US-based um, availability and overall coverage has always been an issue because we might have leads coming in, you know, early morning, late at night on weekends, if we don't have someone working that time, and it takes several hours or days to get to a lead, we, we pretty much probably lost that lead. Yeah. And so we, we just switched to now we have four full time virtual assistant leads managers for full coverage, um, always have two on at all times from 8am uh, to 8 p.m. Okay. And then uh, sh shorten that a tiny bit on Sundays and Saturdays, um, but still working on uh, almost full full two people coverage uh, seven days a week to make sure that speed to lead is as low as possible. Our goal is three minutes from when a lead comes in to when we contact them. Uh, so that's our, our leads management department. Uh, we have another VA who does contract prep, um, looking up additional property information like the, the tax uh, parcel ID, uh, confirming certain stats of the house, confirming what type of uh, utilities it has, all those basic yeah. kind of things. Um, and then another VA who does uh, dispo for us. That's awesome, man. So you really are heavily VA based and you have the acquisitions department and your COO. So you can probably keep your overhead nice and lean with that strategy. Yeah. I, I mean, what, I, what we've found is that as long as it doesn't need to be something in person or a high level strategic based decision, a VA can do almost anything. Yeah. Um, so much of it, you know, the great thing about this is that it's a business, so it can be systematized. You can put processes in place, you can automate things. And so as long as you have the proper training and uh, quality control measures in place so that you can make sure things are being done properly, processes are being followed, then you can automate and, and delegate uh, so much of the business. That's so true, man. And I hope everyone rewinds that. And it's like, that's when you know you have a real business. If you can have it systematized to its simplest form where, like you said, a VA can do it. I was really good friends with a sales trainer named John Martinez. And uh, he was talking on a podcast and he was saying like, he's not going to do his boot camps now in person himself because he believes so much in his sales process that he can have other people, including yours truly, help teach that system. Because if it's a real system, then someone else can teach and he doesn't have to be there. And I'm like, oh, that's really, it's a good litmus test to put a lot of that processes through to see if someone else can do that um, to see how well you are at systematizing. That's awesome, man. So 10 wholesales a month in New York, definitely not an easy, uh, easy assignment at all. And obviously you guys are getting it done. In the Rochester area, like, are you guys seeing, like you said, the market's cooling down a little bit up down here. That's a little bit true, but there's still a lot of pent up demand from people getting out of the Manhattan area, going to Long Island and up here to the Hudson Valley. Are you guys seeing like down by us, like some, some, cause the Rochester isn't like dirt, dirt cheap, like Cleveland, Ohio. So you guys have some pretty good priced houses or what, what are the wholesale fees like in Rochester? Are they, are they pretty juicy or are they pretty kind of middle of the pack? Like, what does that kind of look like with volume? So it fluctuates a little bit based on the market, but yeah. it'll always pretty much be between 14 and 18,000. Oh man, that's awesome. That is awesome, man. You guys are crushing it up there. 
that's yeah. awesome. Yeah, that's a good, uh, that's a good volume based business, man. That that is really really good. And then, are you doing any rentals as well? Or are you just doing all buy and sells? Man, I I had rentals in New York. Yeah. I I sold them all. Actually, my last one I sold. It should be closing in a couple of weeks here. Uh, just being, I mean, right now being a landlord oh, is tough for a lot of brutal people in New York. I got rentals right uh, now that drive me crazy. Yeah. And then being in New York as well. So I do want to hold, uh, rentals again, but not in New York. Yeah. I have a tenant dude. I, this is crazy story. So I got this lead last year and the lady would not get on the phone with me. She's, I, I wholesale the house down the street. So I knew the area really well. And she's like, listen, I got your, she actually, dude, this is, she, I mailed her, she snail mailed me back. So I got a letter in the mail from her and she's like, if you want to sell, email me. So I'm like, whatever, email her. She tells me she wants to sell. She's got a tenant in place. So they've been there for 20 years. And I, I made her a crazy offer that I didn't think she was going to take. She said, no, I followed up with her. She ended up selling me this property. Could never see it. Could never talk to the tenants, completely sight unseen, but I stole the property. It didn't even matter. So, man, I have had these tenants for almost a year now. And I got to tell you right now, being a landlord in New York, I mean, as you obviously know, anyone listening, you're in a tough, tough position, uh, especially if they've been living there for a while and they have a family in their house. Good luck. <laughs> Good luck, because you ain't getting them out anytime soon. So I'm going through that right now, and it is a pain in the ass. So I totally get it, man. I totally get it. There's a lot of places. I did an eviction one time in Texas with a squatter. And we literally put a notice on the door. It fell off. So then we went back. I didn't go, but my buddy went back, put it back on the door. The guy saw it. He knew he was screwed, walked out of there, put it back on the market. But in New York, I found that a lot of the tenants, they know that it's so easy to stay there. So like I offer cash for keys and they tell me to take a hike. They're like, get out of here. We don't want you. We don't want your 10 grand. We don't want your five grand. We're going to stay here for free for five years. So it's really hard to negotiate with these people. So I'm, I'm cautious now when I buy properties sight unseen, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Crazy. Yeah, man. I, I have uh, no desire to, to be a landlord <laughs> in New York state anymore. I mean, especially with everything going on, yeah, um, man. you know, it, it was tough enough before and now it's just no thanks. Yeah. Especially, I mean, if you go into like the inner city of Rochester, I mean, there's some tough neighborhoods there, section eight, it, it it's nasty. I, I've spent some time in Rochester. There's great areas. There's, it's like any area, great areas. There's bad areas. Uh, anytime you're going to get involved in the inner cities of any reasonably sized city, you're going to run into trouble. So, uh, yeah. I know you have some other businesses that, uh, you know, I was doing some homework on you before we did this interview. So I know you have a few other businesses that you kind of started. So I'd kind of see if uh, you'd be open to sharing kind of some of those other businesses you've started, you know, um, besides just the, the real estate uh, investing business. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, one that, um, we've been, we've been working on for a while, super excited about it, um, hits uh, some slight delays, but, uh, we're still launching it, uh, call it letter bandits. Uh, where we focus on uh, real, by a real person, 100% real handwritten letters uh, for direct mail. I mean, the response rates are ridiculous. We can get it done at a fraction of the price of other mail houses. Like, I mean, literally a fraction. So the, the returns on investment are just crazy. Um, and so we're going to be bringing that out um, as, as a service. And then um, based on, you know, a lot of the success that we've had, you know, have a lot of people reaching out to us, um, asking questions, looking for help. Um, and I've been, you know, throughout my career, I've had some, some highs, some, some real lows, um, had a lot of help throughout the whole process and continue to get help um, from a lot of people. And so I am passionate about coaching, about giving back, about helping uh, entrepreneurs to empower themselves and get educated to change their lives through real estate wholesaling. And so we, we coach people, um, giving them the, the systems and the processes and the accountability to change their lives and to learn everything they need to learn without having to sift through all the noise and all yeah. the confusion out there. Because uh, it's not, you know, if you look on YouTube, you look on Instagram, you look anywhere, it's not a lack of information. There's no. more than enough information. Yeah. Uh, but there is a lack of clarity and there's a lack of accountability. And so what I've found, you know, more often than not, when people come to me, they say, I don't know where to start. 
I don't know what to do next. There are so many options. There are so many things I'm considering. And so it, it confuses people and it paralyzes people. And so they get stuck with this analysis paralysis and they, the shiny object syndrome, and they're not sure what to do. And, and they try like getting all creative with stuff and like putting their own spin on things when they haven't yeah. even mastered the fundamentals yet. Yeah. And, and so we focus on getting people really good at the basics of wholesaling, of the basics of running a business, because this should be a business. It can be totally. a phenomenal business, but most people who get into it have no idea how to actually run a business. Totally. And so getting that component in there. And then the personal development component as well, which I think is huge. Um, and that's where I think a lot of people miss out on is they, they train the skill set, but not the mindset, because you can have all the skills, the strategies, the tactics in the world. But if you don't have the mindset to back it up, if you don't have the belief in yourself to do it, if you don't have the big why and that vision behind it all to keep you going forward through the tough times, you're just going to quit. Or you're not going to push as hard as you need to, to really gain that traction and move forward to achieve what you set out to. And so we weave in that personal development component and make sure that we're holding people accountable and forcing them, not forcing, but highly encouraging yeah. them to take yeah. action because, you know, it doesn't matter what you know, if you don't take action on it. Totally. So I like to say not reading is the same as not knowing how to read. It's no different. So taking a course, taking a, joining a mastermind, doing whatever, and not taking action on it is the same as never having done those things at all. So we make sure that our students are consistently taking action on the one most important thing for them that week so that they can get the results that they came here to get in the first place, which for most of us is that financial freedom and that time freedom and just the freedom to make choice. Totally. I, I love how you said that. That was very well said. And it's so true, right? Like at the end of the day, you go on YouTube, you can find out how to go on prop stream and pull a vacant house list, but having the mindset to understand how to strategize that and go through the tough times and get the nose. That's what is hard to, um, it's hard for people to execute that. So when they can have someone to hold them accountable, I mean, it is so, so, so powerful. And another thing I've found too, like, you know, when you can work with someone who's been there and they can give you that wisdom from experience, it makes all the difference. There's a gentleman who I've been mentoring. We've been doing some JV deals with together and uh, you know, he's, you know, making his way in wholesaling. He's done some deals, but I'm able to go on and really help him out and tell him that he's not like he, sometimes he might think that his situation is unique and it's only happening to him. And I'm like, dude, listen, I've been here before. I'll be here again. This happens to everyone, no matter what your net worth is. Stay in the game. Keep doing these three things and you'll be fine. And that insight is all the difference because information, like you said, is, is literally a dime a dozen nowadays. And, and the real value comes from the insight and the confidence that a coach can give you, you know, because, you know, they have your best interest there at heart. So I love how you're doing that for the community. I'm looking forward to the launch. Let me know when your letter banders, letter bandits launches. Cause I'm a direct mail fiend. So yeah. I'm always looking to send out different types of letters and uh, you know, have an advantage in my marketplace, dude. So uh, last but not least, I know you have an event coming up relatively soon, depending on when people are listening to this, it's August 10th, 2021. So um, feel free to talk about this event that you're putting on and uh, I'll make sure this show airs before the event. So obviously if people want to go, they can hear this and head over there. So tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so August 21st, uh, it's a full day event. Um, we are breaking down the fundamentals of how to run a reliable wholesaling business. So our three-step reliable wholesaling system, how to get the most leads you can, how to convert those leads into deals and how to sell those deals for an wow. average profit of $15,000. So that those are the fundamentals of a wholesaling business. If you can get down those three things, you're going to be in business. And for so sure. we break that down step by step, giving you the game plan that you need to run a consistently profitable business so that you can have what you came here into this business to get, which is that, that time freedom, that financial freedom, that freedom of choice. Yeah. 
And so making sure that you're, you're held accountable to those results, you're taking consistent action on the most important things, which is so key because so many people will take action on the wrong things. They'll try to, you know, they're taking action on like creating their, their business card and their logo and all that stuff. And they don't even have a sales process yet. Yeah. And so they're focusing on the wrong things. And so we, we help to guide people on, this is what you focus on first. This is what you do next. So it's just the game plan to cut out the confusion, avoid all the noise. And so that people can move forward confidently, knowing that if they take action on these specific steps, they can get the results. So it's a one day full event. It's all recorded. So people can go back to it time and time again to see what their next step is to review the notes because it's going to be full of awesome information um just giving people that confidence to take action and move forward and achieve that vision that they got into this for i love that and is it in person or is it virtual so this is all virtual oh Um, even better so yeah, we have people from all over the country that, that reach out for help. And so we want to make it accessible uh, to as many people as possible. So it's all, uh, it's going to be all day. It's a virtual event, uh, all recorded. So you can check it out anytime after the fact. Uh, but it's only, we're doing this one time. So it's just that August 21st, uh, we'll start at 9 a.m. Eastern and around five. We'll have a few little breaks in there, but we're going to be touching on a lot of topics uh, making sure that people have the plan to move forward confidently. Um, and that can be found at our, our website, um, actiondanbro.com. I love that domain, actiondanbro.com. We'll make sure we have that in our show notes and we'll make sure this airs before the event if people want to take a look at that, actiondanbro.com. And I just got to say, man, putting in the work in this business from my personal experience is a thousand percent worth it. I remember in the beginning I had my doubts and I was a young kid trying to make it. I never came from a family of entrepreneurs, never came from like crazy amounts of wealth. And I was always like, well, is this going to be worth it? Putting up these bandit signs going to be worth it or handwriting these letters going to be worth it. And I can say financially change my freaking life, dude. My life financially is completely 180 in a good way from committing to this business. I have more freedom than I know what to do with. Sometimes it gets me in trouble. (laughs) And uh, because of that, I fly all over the country and pretty much live in two places. And I'm able to do what I want when I want with who I want. And I can tell all the listeners right now, I'm not flexing. Dan's not flexing. It is a thousand percent worth it. You just got to do the work. You got to do the right work. Like Dan says, and know what is important. And uh, dude, I really, really appreciate you coming on the show. I, I don't know you too well still, but I'm looking forward to connecting in the future. You're an awesome guy. I can just sense your generosity through the Zoom call here. And it has really been an honor to have you on my podcast and the value that you've provided uh, has been wonderful today. So uh, we'll have actiondanbro.com in the show notes as well as Dan. What's the best way for people to check you out on social media so they can follow you and get linked into your world? Yeah, Instagram is going to be the best way. And that's just at actiondanbro. Uh, and Greg, uh, really appreciate you having me on here and, uh, allowing me to share my story and, and hopefully help, uh, help your listeners here. I really appreciate it, Dan. I hope you have a great day, buddy. You too, man. Thanks for listening to another episode of pave the way podcast. We hope you got value from today's episode. Make sure you download Greg's free guide on daily personal productivity for free at www.pavetheday.com. That's pave the day spelled D-A-Y dot com. If you have any questions or want to reach out, head over to www.pavethewaypodcast.com. We'll see you on the next episode.